I was a freelance writer in 69. I heard about it. And I covered the war for, for years as a, for the Associated Press. And I, I even left. I was so rattled by the war, so convinced that the war was such a wrong that I, I took journalism in 1968 to work for Senator Eugene McCarthy. who was running against the war, the only Democrat who would run against it. And I was a speechwriter, and I became his press secretary, and I was sort of di vigilantly, and everybody told me, I'm, I'm dead in journalism, you can't do that, you can't cross this barrier between press and politics, which is done all the time now. But, but then I, it was a real risky thing to do. But he was going to, he took on the war as a moral issue. He was a Jesuit, and um, uh, a really vigorous Jesuit. I mean, he really, uh, uh, he, uh, I was his Jewish press secretary, and I wasn't allowed to tell anybody he went to Mass every morning. He re considered religion his private business. Um, and his best buddies were bishops. He'd gone to a seminary. And um, um, uh, it's a fascinating time in history. He just was a man who saw the war in a way that nobody sees it now in America. He saw it as a moral wrong. And that word has disappeared from the political lexicon. Not here. There's a lot of talk about Amnesty International, for which I'm speaking. I mean, these, they always speak to the power and they always worry about morality, which is the reason I'm here, because of. Um, because of what that group does and what it represents. Human Rights Watch also. They're not alone. There are a lot of other people. But we don't talk about morality. Anyway, so Milo is uttering this curse. And what, I, what happened is I learned about uh, Milo and I ran and found the kids. I began running around the country. Um, I, you ever see those ads? Um, um, uh, I, I'm American Express. Those ads, um, you know, the famous ads for American Express. And I, I, was, I, I just got an American Express card. And I just keep on thinking when I see these ads about people talking about how American Express, you know, I'm a, American Express helped me expose the meal I massacre. It's not a, it's not an ad they're going to do. <laughs> but I had no money, and I was just building it on my card, flying around because I had no. I was, you know, a hand to mouth kid, 69. You know, gas costs uh, 25 cents a gallon, and heating oil is 18 cents, so you can make a living on a couple hundred bucks a week, or less. Um, anyway, so. Uh, uh, Nobody tells me about me. I've written a couple of stories, and I'm syndicating these stories. No newspaper would publish it, even though I'd been press secretary or president, written for all the major magazines. I was a pretty well-known freelighter. I'd been a, a senior AP correspondent covering the war. They knew me, and I, didn't, I wasn't lacking for freelance work, but nobody would run it. So we set up a news agency, an independent news agency, sort of a shrewd move. A friend of mine was deeply involved, a really smart guy who's now naturally a Hollywood mogul. And we set up a, um, a um, independent news, and we, we got a lawyer to vet it. Uh, and um, a good lawyer read it competently, and we syndicated it. So newspapers were just buying a news agency story. They weren't publishing something on their own. With one level of responsibility removed. And it worked. People were publishing the stories. But the kids I talked to, for weeks, I was running around doing story after story. And sort of the whole press corps was sort of going, oh, what's he going to do next? And they waited. It's sort of like Abu Ghraib. I did the same thing then. Uh, but what happened was, um, one person told me about Milo. What happened? And what a story. What an amazing story. He sits down, he's screaming, God will punish me, and finally the chopper takes him away. So I go looking for Milo. The good thing was, the bad thing was, no Google, no search engine. The good thing was, it was M-E-A-D-L-O, somewhere in Indiana. I found him. It took, I was calling, the, those days, you could get information free. I was in Salt Lake City, and I learned this, and I, I spent, oh, what, half a night calling every local exchange. I finally found a Milo, called up, and I got... Oh, I don't know, I spent most of the day, I got a, a, a very rural voice, a woman, and I said, I'm looking for Paul Meadow. She said, well, he's next door. And I, so I told her what I was doing. I'm a reporter. I want to talk to your son. She said, I don't know if he'll talk to you. I said, how's his leg? She said, not so good. You know, it hurts. Or whatever. So I, I'm coming. So I flew wherever, all night. I remember flying. Paul Meadow lived in a town called New Goshen, Indiana, which is below Terre Haute, which is below Indianapolis, which is below Chicago. Believe me, it was hard. I got a rent a car, I got to Terre Haute, I had no idea. It was a chicken farm. I finally pull in. I don't know if any of you remember Norman Rockwell, the American iconic painter who paints all these pictures of rural life in America, sort of idyllic. This was not rural life in America. <laughs> this was a chicken farm with no man around. Uh, run down, the, it was a shack near the Wabash River in, so, in the deep south, really. The Ku Klux Klan was operating in southern Indiana until the late 50s. I mean, it was really rural south. And uh, uh, the cages were all messed up, and you could just see no man. And the, the house, there was the cages, and there was this ratty house, and I pull up in front of it, and out walks the old lady, the lady I talked with the night before. She's maybe 50, but she looks 70. 
and she comes up to me, and I have, this, I have my little ratty suit on, and I pretend to be a journalist, which I am. I walk out, and I introduce myself, and I say, and, and, and I say, can I see him? She says, well, I don't know if he'll talk to you, but he's in there, and she pointed to the shack that was their home. And then, and then, this lady, this rural lady said to me, quote, unquote, she said, I gave them a good boy, and they sent me back a murderer. Okay? Wow. Flash forward 35 years. I'm doing Abu Ghraib. And I'm at now with the New Yorker, which is very exalted, with elaborate checking procedures. And I get this great story, and I, this great story with this wonderful general who did a report that was dazzling. No question. This is, I, I thought this was going to be... We... Um, it doesn't matter what I thought. We ran the story. Uh, we do the story, and I keep on going, because I know... This comes from on high. Again, heuristically, you don't do what we're doing unless it's on high. Too many people knew. There were too many people at Abu Ghraib. Too many people watched what was going on. This humiliation. It's all part of breaking down prisoners. Really what it was part of, the idea was, we had nobody inside. And what you want to do is you want to get some of these young males we captured. We want to put them in a position where we photograph them nude. In the Koran it says twice. You cannot show a nude, man cannot show his nudity to another man, let alone to, you know, you cannot do it. You go to any sports club in, in Cairo, uh, private showers. If, there, if there's a collective shower in the sports club, uh, everybody wears shorts. And, uh, you know, and a Westerner, you wear shorts uh, out, of, out, of, out of just respect for their, their, um, their beliefs. And so the idea was, I think, the intellectual idea is we were going to break down and get incriminating evidence on some of these guys and send them back home and tell them to find the insurgency and join it and then tell us what's going on or we'll, we'll show these parents to their schoolmates and the woman in the neighborhood and they'll be ruined forever, which they would be given the mores. You know, that's a society that operates on shame. We operate here on guilt. You know, it's, but whatever. That may, may have been the idea. It's all lost in what happened. So I'm doing this story and I'm convinced Rummy's involved. I'm convinced it goes to the top. I have more than, I have a lot of reason to be convinced. I have, you get in this funny situation, that I, I have paper I can't use because the people that gave it to me would be burned forever. So I can't do it. And so, but I know where it goes. So I'm right away. And in between, because the New York is great to me, I'm, I'm, I'm their pimp during the week the magazine's on the newsstand. I'm doing interviews, selling the magazine. That's part of the job. So I'm doing, I've done two stories, I'm doing a third. For some of you don't know The New Yorker, everything is fact-checked. And the final version, when you're finally closing, the, it's a weekly, and it's finally being closed, very high production values. I mean, they independently check everything. So it was just, the whole magazine must have been crashing and all these things. But the last person you meet is the grammarian. And um, you seriously, I was telling somebody earlier, you seriously have conversations about uh, parallelism. And long discussions about, you know, you know, panic. I'm so tired and I've got other stories I want to write. Doing three stories in three weeks in the New York Yorkers, uh, I'm sure it's never been done. Spot stories. I mean, they've done long treatments, but they, I can tell you it's never been done. Because you're having long conversations about whether we should do comma here or comma there. And I'm just, I just want out, but you have to do it. I mean, that's, that's the game. You have to really talk about whether it should be an it or a they. Anyway.